In the first two parts of our adventure, Mike and I explored the Kenai Peninsula, including Homer, Seward, and the Kenai Fjords National Park. Now on day four of our trip, we headed north, back through Anchorage, with our destination being Eagle Crest Alaska Missions Camp, in the small town of Sutton Alpine. On the way, we planned to stop at Chugach State Park, on the east side of Anchorage, a location known for ptarmigan, a major target for our trip. As the highway again took us along the shores of Cook Inlet, we soaked in the spectacular views and passed by one of our first birding stops in Alaska, Potter's Marsh. Without notice, Mike pulled off to the side of the road and came to a screeching halt. I whipped my head around to look out the window to see a cow moose with a very young calf at her side. The constant busy traffic continued to whiz by as if oblivious to the scene, or maybe indifferent. We quickly rolled down our windows and started filming the wildlife show. We then realized that others had stopped and were watching from the other side of the marshy area making the moose somewhat sandwiched between the road and these other viewers. As we pulled away, we watched some of the other viewers back off and give the cow and calf moose a bit more space, thankfully. It was now time to shift gears from coastal species at sea level and climb upward in elevation to look for tundra-dwelling species. Ptarmigan were a particular priority for our trip for a number of reasons. There were three species to find, two of which would be lifers for me and all three of which would be lifers for Mike. Mike has one of the unluckiest track records when trying to find ptarmigan of anyone that I know. In three previous trips to Alaska, he had come up empty-handed after countless miles of driving, hiking, and searching. Would this be the end of his quest? Could we topple his nemesis bird? For another video telling stories about our searches for ptarmigan and for a sneak peek at part four, check out the video linked in the description below. From the Glen Alps Trailhead at Chugach State Park, we planned to ascend the Ballpark Trail to a well-known location for finding ptarmigan. The hike was steep and arduous with very few birds along the way to make it more tolerable. This golden crowned sparrow was one of the few. However, the view once we got on top of Little O'Malley Peak was spectacular, and we added this American pipit to our very short bird list. After our time on Little O'Malley Peak, we descended down to the ballpark. And now it was game time as we began our ptarmigan search. With how camouflaged ptarmigan are, finding one is like searching for the proverbial needle in a haystack. We spread out off trail to cover more ground and checked every rock pile and snow patch while traversing sharp rocky terrain, snow fields, and extreme wind conditions that at times blew us over. We estimated the winds were pushing 80 miles an hour, but the scenery was breathtaking indeed. I suppose if I were a ptarmigan, I would be taking shelter out of the wind too. Despite our best efforts, we could not locate any ptarmigan. Mike's curse was continuing, and now I had become collateral damage to his misfortune. From Chugach State Park, we continued driving north through Palmer towards Sutton Alpine, where we would be staying for the next few days at Eagle Crest Alaska Mission. It was getting late, so we decided to pull off in Palmer and get some food at a Wendy's. 
While waiting in the drive through line, both Mike and I felt something strange. Our car was starting to rock back and forth. Earthquake. I jumped out of the car to stand on the ground and feel the quake, but just as quickly as it had started, it was over. A worker from Wendy's busted out of the door and those ahead of us in line rolled their windows down and proclaimed, Did you feel the earthquake? We later found out that it had been a relatively large earthquake, even for Alaska, and it was 6.1 on the Richter scale. Thankfully, damage was minimal due to it being centered in a low population area to the north of us. We arrived at camp exhausted, ready to rest, but the allure of the midnight sun was too much for me. It is just after midnight here in Sutton, Alaska. And it's about as bright as day. After getting some much needed sleep, we woke to the sun shining brightly, revealing the camp's beautiful setting all the more. The next three days we spent our time doing building projects for the camp, but we reserved the evenings for more birding adventures. The first evening, we drove east down the Glen Allen Highway with the goal of looking for both northern hawk owls and our end goal of looking for great gray owls at the Tulsona Lake Lodge. The highway took us through the beautiful Matanuska River Valley and afforded us spectacular views of the Matanuska Glacier and the Alaska Mountain Range. Eventually the highway breaks out of the valley and becomes rolling hills of boreal forest. This is where the hawk owl searching begins. The difficulty in searching is that many of the treetops of the spruce trees look like a perched hawk owl from a distance. I can't tell you how many times we slammed on the brakes and backed up to view what turned out to be one spruce owl after another. Needless to say, we dipped on Hawk Owl, but the numerous glacial lakes that dotted the landscape were full of waterfowl. We saw ringneck ducks, northern pintails, American widgeon, lesser and greater scop, green winged teal, and trumpeter swans. Also synonymous with wetlands are moose. We saw several, including this cow with two calves and this young bull eating alongside mallards and a widgeon. We eventually found our way to Tulsona Lake Lodge. The lodge was closed, but we started scanning the waterfowl on the lake. Then we noticed movement inside the lodge and eventually a man came to talk to us. It was the lodge's owner and while he had not heard of any great gray owls around, he did invite us in for a drink. We could not pass up the opportunity to have this kind of authentic Alaskan experience. We entered a cavernous bar with taxidermied Alaskan animals of quite a variety. We felt like we had entered a natural history museum. We sat at the bar and chatted with the owner, who is native Alaskan, and his wife, about life in Alaska, the politics of tribal lands, and he shared fabled stories about the various taxidermied mounts in the lodge. All the while, we looked out of the picture window at the waterfowl on Tulsona Lake as the light dimmed on another day in Alaska. On our way back to camp that night, it was relatively dark and dreary with intermittent rain. Then the inevitable happened. A cow, moose, and calf ended up in our headlights, with only enough space for Mike to slam on the brakes to avoid a collision. Thankfully, he was alert enough to do so, and we watched the moose family trot off to the side of the road. The next day, or rather, much later that same day, we finished our work at camp and took off for another adventure 
this time to Hatcher Pass, with the goal of looking, once again, for ptarmigan. Aside from its birding potential, Hatcher Pass is stunningly beautiful. With the road still closed due to snow, we walked the last mile up the road to Independence Mine, an old abandoned gold mining town that operated from 1897 till 1950. Along the way, Arctic ground squirrels scolded us from their rocky perches, and the golden crowned sparrow's mournful whistle of a song was a constant presence. This brave little fellow came right out into the road at our feet, allowing us a very studied look. Once at Independence Mine, we roamed the grounds, which were largely under snow yet, following our curiosity and alert for any birds that may be present. The terrain was a bit treacherous, with steep rocky slopes and having to constantly post hole through the areas of deep, deep snow. Although high altitude areas are generally less diverse with birds, the areas more than make up for it with the scenery. We ended up chasing a couple of magpies around to get some photos before eventually ending up along the Snowmelt Creek where Mike spotted a bird that made the trip up there all the more worth it. He had found a wandering tattler. This shorebird nests in rugged tundra environments like this and winters along the west coast of the United States down into southern Mexico. Being in the Tringa family, they resemble greater and lesser yellow legs, but to me, how they bob their tail while they nervously search the water's edge for food, they act much more like a spotted sandpiper. Either way, it is odd watching a shorebird move across a patch of snow. It was getting late and we were both getting tired. Mike decided to rest in the car, but I decided to make one last push and climb the snow-covered dirt road up to Hatcher Pass, with one final hope of finding a ptarmigan. I was almost too taken by the scenery to even care about if I saw a ptarmigan, which I didn't. But when looking back on it, I didn't care. My heart was full. Alaska, birds or no, is a spectacle to behold that no words, photos, or videos can do justice to. The next day was to be our last at camp before heading northward to explore the eastern end of the Denali Highway and with high hopes for a major lifer in Fairbanks. Stay tuned for episode four to find out what birds and stories to tell await us on the road ahead on this Alaskan birding adventure. <laughs>